All right, thank you. I think we're going to get started. Um, so my name is Amanda Littleton. I work with the Cheshire County Conservation District, and we're very excited to have you here today to talk about soil steaming. Um, this workshop um, is possible through the funding of the U.S. Department of Agriculture SARE program or the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education program through a partner grant. Um, now, before introducing the partners and speakers, I'd just like to go over a few ground rules. Um, first, when not speaking, please try to keep yourself muted. Um, there will be a Q&A portion of this later in the workshop, and at that point, um, you know, you can be putting questions in the chat, but there might also be an opportunity for you to unmute and ask your question as well. Um, in the meantime, we'd love to ask you to please introduce yourself in the chat. Um, enter your name, where you're calling in from, and any affiliations. If you have a farm or an organization that you represent, it'd be great to know. And particularly with that um, information about your introduction, if there's questions or anything you hope that we dig into on soil steaming, it would be great to start to put that in the chat as well. That way it helps to give our speakers um, and the facilitator for the panel discussion later some ideas of where the conversation can go. So um, that um, introduced our speakers. We're really excited to have Bruce Wister of Piccadilly Farm with us, who is our partner on the SARE Partnership Grant. Also, Andre Cataumo of Heron Pond Farm, Becky Madden with UVM Extension, Andy Pressman of NCAT Northeast, Jeremy Delisle of UNH Cooperative Extension as well. Um, so we'll hear from everyone throughout this workshop. Um, next step, just share what our plan is for the agenda. So we're going to jump right into the producer roundtable. Bruce, um, Andre, oops, I apologize for the typo there, not Andrea. I'll change that quickly. Um, and Becky um, are all going to have some time to speak, and then we're going to jump into a QA and a um, with Jeremy, and then Andy is going to wrap it up for us and um, provide any additional resources or questions. So I'll just share before um, before we jump into the um, into the panel discussion that we started this program um, to make a soil steamer available for rent to producers in our region, and this is something that. If you are interested in it, we'd be happy to talk to you more about. We do have a rental program that's active um, in partnership with Piccadilly Farm um, in the Cheshire County, New Hampshire area. Um, though the steamer has moved around um, to neighboring counties in Vermont, Massachusetts, and throughout New Hampshire as well. So we'd be happy to answer questions on that if you're interested in utilizing the equipment throughout the discussion. All right, so I think with that, just remind everybody to put your questions in the chat throughout the panel. And I'm gonna turn it over to Bruce to kick us off for the panel discussion. Thanks, Bruce. Thank you, Amanda. Yes, hello everybody. I am uh, Bruce Worcester from Piccadilly Farm. And I've been farming here with my wife, Jenny, since about 2006. And uh, we do certified organic vegetables that we sell uh, mostly through wholesale, and also have done some CSA. So what I want to do is um, take my time to just do a brief sort of go over of the basics, the how to uh, show you a little bit of how this steamer works for uh, doing soil steaming inside a high tunnel. So that's going to involve sharing my screen. <laughs> Let's get to that first. All right, have I got a slideshow queued up? Does that look, okay, great. So um, for this demonstration, I've got about 10 slides and um, most of them are from uh, Piccadilly Farm with a workshop that we did um, last summer. And there's also a few slides and, um, and whatnot from Becky Madden from work that she's done. So I took a few of her slides and added in a few of mine and, and here we are. So you can see, uh, in this picture, I'm outside uh, our tunnel, and this is the 
the steam generator that we're using in the rental program now, and uh, it's made by the Sioux Corporation, and it's the one that we purchased with the grant money that Amanda was talking about. And we do have a whole guide sheet, a, a document that's maybe uh, six or eight pages that goes over more of the specifics about how you run this unit. And it, it looks a little bit more intimidating than it, than it is. A lot of it are just some safety features that make sure that if things get too hot or too pressurized, the unit will shut itself off automatically. But uh, basically to run this unit, you wanna have some household electric current, um, regular plug-in, and you need to get a source of water. And um, you can see in this picture, I don't know, can you guys see my cursor moving around? So here's where the garden hose attaches uh, right to the steamer. So if you've got water that can supply about 45 PSI, sort of regular household pressure, um, it wants at least two gallons a minute and get your household current set up. So you position the steamer um, close to your beds and it has to be more or less level uh, in order for the uh, water to heat up and work properly inside the unit. And um, it's going to generate the steam. And then at the back of the unit where my cursor is now and near where I'm standing in the picture where there are two uh, red gate valves there, uh, like, like a water faucet. And so you open those, either of those valves uh, and steam comes out, goes into this steam hose and, and on from there. Uh, this picture shows inside one of uh, Becky's high tunnels, I believe, and uh, you can see she's got uh, ground set up and some steaming uh, in progress. One question is, what's a good area to steam at once? And in our several years of experience, we seem to be um, settling in at around 6, 600 square feet would be a maximum, and many of us are using 100-foot tunnels. So you can do a five foot wide bed or a six foot wide bed. Uh, at, at Piccadilly, we have some basically five foot beds. So we're doing five by a hundred for each of our runs. So in order to steam a tunnel at my farm, it takes six runs to do it. Now I uh, bounce back over to Piccadilly Farm. And this is a little bit of bed preparation to show you uh, what we were doing last summer before planting. And you can see here, we've just got our beds laid out and I've got some walkways delineated with strings. And the finish here is a little bit rough. And in our case, we're gonna be transplanting kale. So uh, we're okay with a little bit of trash on the surface and okay with a little bit of uh, unevenness to the beds. But that's our setup. And another important detail is, your, is, is water, soil moisture. And you want the soil to be nicely moist, like, hey, things are perfect. It's not too wet, it's not too dry. Um, being both too wet and too dry can make it hard for the steam to percolate properly through the soil. So that's why we're going for, for just right. And this picture shows me getting ready with a canvas steam sock. It's kind of in the center of this uh, edge bed that I have here. And um, it's about, uh, five or six inches in diameter. And if you look close, you can see every two feet or so on, on this side of it, there's only one every four feet, but there's a little grommet hole. So the steam is gonna enter this sock, it's gonna fill up the sock, and then it's gonna push out through the grommets and, um, and go from there. This connection I wanted to show before it's covered over by the tarp, uh, shows the black steam hose delivering the steam from the steam generator to the header of my bed where it just uh, connects with a screw-on fitting um, onto the hose. Next step is to cover over with the tarp and weight down the tarps with chain. And uh, we have some chain that go with, travel with the unit for the rental program. And we do find that it's you want to walk over the chain step by step just to press it into the soil. And that's going to make sure that the steam stays inside your steaming area and not leak out the sides. So this is back over at that edge bed where I put the, the canvas steam sock down, weighted it down with chain, and we've just started the run here. So you can see that there's a little bit of billowing um, as the steam starts to fill up the space. And then after maybe an hour, a little less, a little more, depending on what soil temp you're starting with, but 
this is where we want to get to to have a nice um, billowing tent of steam that's then going to be working from the tent area down into the soil uh, to do the steam run. Here the steam run is finished and uh, I'm just starting to pull back the tarp. You can see things are hot. Uh, gloves is good. Um, right here, I'm just showing you some of the mechanics and there is more to talk about in terms of how long do you run, what temperature you're trying to get. But all of these things can be controlled with uh, temperature sensors that we stick in the soil. I've got a, a slide to show you how I've been doing that. Um, and also we've taken to letting our run coast for a little bit at the end. We shut off the steam and find that the temps will continue to percolate and hold in the soil for uh, 30 minutes uh, without having to run the, the fuel and run the generator so the steaming can still happen. So usually I'm not pulling the, the plastic back, the tarp back right away, but in this case for our demonstration, we, we were finishing one run when the workshop began and starting another. So we're just making a move right here. This picture shows an old steam sock uh, that was an old piece of hydraulic hose that we were using before switching back to the, the canvas with the grommets. There is a little bit of time involved with moving from one run to the next and uh, it can be a little bit tricky logistically to make sure you're not stepping in the wrong place or know where to put your chains uh, since the tarp is down on the ground, but with some strings and markers at the end and uh, possibly working with a couple people or, or, or whatnot to, to get the moves right. This picture here, if you look, you can see, um, see if I can get it with a cursor. I've, I've made some blocks right here, one, two, three, and each of those has a temperature probe in it. Uh, and we use like a meat thermometer style probe. So the probe itself is maybe six inches long. And so I, I made those blocks just right so that there's two inches of probe sticking out of the of the bottom end of it. So I can stick that block on the soil and I know I've got my probe down to two inches deep. And that's the temperature that we've been sensing our temperature for to try and get to 170 degrees for, for half an hour. So we can move around these probes and we usually put one in the middle and one in the first uh, uh, quarter to third and one in the last uh, third to quarter. And then this is a picture about uh, two or three weeks later that there's kale transplants in there and uh, they've started in fine and uh, we don't have any weeds. So there I'm going to stop the share. And that's sort of the, the nuts and bolts. Uh, we may get into more questions in the Q&A portion, but I'll, I'll hold off now. Maybe if there's some in the chat, I can take a look after my, my time with it. But uh, at the farm, we've been steaming uh, for two, two annual cycles now, uh, both cases in the fall, August, September, ahead of our fall planting. And in particular, our goal is to eliminate the chickweed pressure so that we have a better time with the growth and harvest of, uh, in this case, we had kale, and we also typically do a house in spinach. And to be able to do those crops without the chickweed has been great. And um, both of these past two winters, the, the chickweed pressure has been almost non-existent. We really haven't had to do uh, any hand weeding, except maybe a little bit around the, the headlands. And it is hard to get the chain right up against the baseboard at the outside, so that uh, that takes a little bit more work to to get that uh, successful. In our couple of years, one of the things we've been playing around is the temperature, and we have been finding that the steam can uh, unevenly heat the tunnel that we've created. And so we're we're playing around with uh, shutting off the steam when it gets too hot in any one of the three sensing places giving some time for the steam to migrate from the hot spot to the cooler spots without getting the hot spot too hot. And we've also been playing around, like I said earlier, with shutting off the steam about a half an hour before we're finished and letting that all coast. So the benefits of this fine tuning are both fuel savings and then also uh, trying to make sure that we're not getting hotter than we need to be. And the, where you need to be can depend on what you're trying to control for. And it seems like the 170 degrees for 30 minutes is fine uh, for chickweed if we're measuring down to a depth of two inches. 
but depending on what's going on and, and maybe root diseases that you're trying to control for in tomatoes, for instance, you may want to be going deeper um, and getting hotter. Um, there are some industry standards and the collective research seemed to indicate that if you're at 180 degrees in your target area for half an hour, that's going to also uh, take care of pathogens and not just uh, weed seeds. So we may be able to delve a little deeper into that as we go. And I think that I may hold it there. Um, if any of the other presenters wanted to chime in with something to add or a detail before we get to the others, and then we can do more uh, questions when we get to the Q&A. That sounds great, Bruce. Thank you. Um, if there's nothing anybody has to add right now, I think I'll hand it over to Becky. Thanks, Amanda. Bruce, that was really helpful. Um, it's been great learning kind of collectively about all this. And I think, can you guys see my screen okay? I hope so. Um, yeah. Yeah. Great, thanks. Um, so I'm, um, we're gonna switch gears a little bit and Bruce and Andre are really experts on the mechanics of steaming. So we're gonna lean on them to cover the technicalities of the actual process. Um, I'm coming at this from a slightly different angle, I guess kind of a hybrid angle as both a farmer and as a applied researcher with UVM extension. So as Bruce mentioned, chickweed is really the problem a lot of growers in the Northeast are trying to address with soil steaming. There's definitely broader industry uses for steaming that we can talk about. And you know, a lot of flower growers and tomato growers have other issues. But on my farm, this is what things were looking like a few years ago. And over time, I've heard Andre and um, folks from, you know, Paul and Sandy Arnold and Jericho Settlers, lots of farmers talking about soil steaming. So I knew about it and was um, curious about its application on my farm. And also in my work at UVM Extension, I work primarily on soil health. And with all of these practices like tarping, solar, solarizing, steaming, um, biofumigation, the question is always like, what's happening to the soil microbes and what's happening to our soil health? So I was trying to hone in on some of those questions um, as a rookie <laughs> soil steamer. So just to show a little bit more of what was happening with chickweed, um, direct seeded spinach, this is the populations we were looking at. And then you can see the harvest is really pretty impossible on direct seeded spinach when you have a chickweed infestation. It's probably a familiar sight to many of you. And then as Bruce mentioned, there are other problems. So we've got damping off, which is a big problem on winter greens on the left. And then who knows what else is going on with tomatoes. We're, you know, I think the big picture that troubles me the most and is kind of where my brain is going to now is like our overall soil health and soil health management and tunnels is really kind of bound up in the constrictions of, of our cash crop pressures. And also it's just a unique system. We're not getting rainfall. We're putting in really high nutrient inputs and we're pushing these systems hard. So our typical practices we know promote soil health like cover cropping and resting the soil, we're just not doing in tunnels. And it's not because we're terrible stewards of the land, it's because we're commercial growers. And so I think that's where I'm getting to with all of this is like, it's just a really unique system and we have to think about it in a different way. So um, Bruce touched on this, like the different temperatures at which different pathogens and weed seeds are controlled. And soil steaming has been used for centuries as a technology or um, heat treatment, I should say. People have known that you can heat up the soil and control different problems. And especially before chemical fumigation was used this, you know, like in the early 1900s, soil steaming in particular was used. And it really like dovetailed with the, nurse, the nursery industry growing when you needed like sterile potting media, this was really one of the only ways to do it. So there's, there is some literature on this and it's useful to look at. Um, so this kind of outlines, you know, on the left is Fahrenheit. Um, so 180, as Bruce mentioned, is kind of the, been the standard that we've learned from. But as I was kind of 
thinking early on about this research, you know, looking below 180, like what are the things that are controls? You've got um, weed seeds, which need a pretty hot temperature, right? 160 to 180. Um, and then pathogenic fungi and bacteria are quite low down there. And then Pythium, which is one of the most annoying problems is quite low. So just kind of using that to kind of outline the research questions we were developing. Oh, and I should say nitrifying bacteria, that's an important one too. We're killing those and we, we like those, we need them. <laughs> so that leads to other problems. So these are the questions we developed, you know, pretty simple, like what's the impact of steam temperature on chickweed microbes and nutrients? And is there any corollary impact on soil borne diseases? And then just because I'm new to this, I was curious about best practices. Um, so I've been trying to develop some kind of like very rough beginner outlines for soil steaming. I'm gonna blow through the results because we've got like a couple minutes just to kind of share what we've found in um, this little bit of time. So we, um, I was surprised. Well, first of all, I was like super naive in thinking I could actually control temperatures <laughs> accurately. As Bruce mentioned, it's like very kind of like, you know, you put in like five different probes and temperatures are all over the place under the tarp. And I've been grateful that he and Andre have developed these more refined techniques for temperature evenness. But um, I was <laughs> I was warned, but it wasn't as easy as I thought. So I bought a used steamer and um, couldn't even get it up to 180 the first year. But I was like, sweet, 140. I got this great control. <laughs> I could just like end the project here, right? Um, 120 is not so great, but we do see this difference between 120 and 140. So I was very encouraged by this. Um, also learned the hard way that if you disturb the soil at all, like I know it's a basic principle of weed management, you don't want to disturb the soil after you've controlled them, but um, we like to do dumb things over and over again. So that's what we saw here, um, planting or even just a gentle, um, management of the soil afterwards, you do see that seed populations are quite high, at least in our system. So comparing um, 120, 140, 160, again, we're seeing like, you know, I think 160 is actually optimum, but pretty good control. Um, I was curious also about the carryover from year to year with these high populations and the fact that we are tilling between crops, I think we're gonna need multiple years. So it kind of bears the question of like, how can we practically do this? We have 10 tunnels on my farm. As Bruce was saying, it takes like six rounds. It's a lot of time and fuel. So trying to figure out if you can like blast the populations in two or three years of steaming or um, how we can kind of best manage that. And just these populations that are, get kind of maintained in the edges and corners is troubling for me. And I also, like, as I was reading more and more about this, that's also where the populations of Pythium and other soil-borne diseases are hanging out. So you're creating reservoirs, any areas that are missed are a reservoir for future problems. So I think one of the lingering questions for me is actually when we go to lower temperatures, are we just producing incomplete treatments? And also with these areas that are incompletely steamed, and are we leaving behind things that we actually don't want? Like originally I was like, oh, let's keep the things we do want, but are we actually um, creating hot spots? So weed seeds being the obvious one, but are there other pathogens that are hanging out? And I did that on purpose, stupidly, um, um, threatening my marriage really by leaving a control treatment in one of the tunnels. <laughs> and I was like, I'm gonna be a real researcher, but I'm you know, doing this on my own farm. So here, here you go, I left a, a control um, in one house and over the last three years, it has just become this reservoir of problems. The whole house was super clean, except for that one area. Um, so again, complete treatment seems to be really important. Um, Amanda, do I, should I shut up? or I've got if like, you have, a if you have more to share, feel free to use some, a few more minutes. Absolutely okay. have time. So just quickly, I'm, I'm just going to describe what we saw with the microbes. Um, Cause I think that is the thing people are interested in. Um, I was new to measuring these things. So I reached out to some um, soil ecologists, Deb Nair, and uh, who's a professor up at UVM and her graduate student, Anna Brown were tremendously helpful. They suggested using these things called eco plates, which are basically like a very generalist way to understand the consumption of carbon in the soil, which is what organisms are eating. It doesn't tell you exactly who's there, but it tells you two things. 
One is the rate of consumption of the carbon substrates in the tunnels or in the soil. And then the other is the um, diversity of organisms that are consuming the carbon substances. So you basically like take the soil, I didn't do this, they did this, but take the soil, dilute it, put it in these plates you see up here. And then when they get purple, the varying degrees of purple reflect the amount of consumption and the diversity of um, organisms. So kind of cool, it doesn't exactly hone in on who's there, but it gives us a big overall picture of what's happening with steaming. So as we would expect from the literature, most organisms are killed by steaming and it doesn't seem to matter exactly what temperature based on my like, you know, this is just like two years of research, not like exactly the, you know, publishable, but um, we see it drop and then over the course of the year, it's climbing up. So I really only sampled, I did a bunch of samples right after steaming, the dots represent when I did it and then six months out and then a year out. So we're back up after a year, but there's a precipitous drop and that was what we expected. But the diversity actually goes up a little bit and then kind of plateaus, which is at first I was scratching my head, but Deb really um, introduced me to these concepts of um, kind of this rebound. And the analogy I think she gave me was like, if you clear cut a forest that's at its climax, what comes back in like this huge diversity of pioneer species and you're also unlocking all these different substances with steaming. So different microbes are gonna come in and chow down on this like disrupted system. So not sure if it's good or bad, but you do have a broad diversity of um, organisms after steaming. So I think the big take home is yes, steaming is destructive to the microbe populations, but we can also kind of manage for that. And, you know, kind of the next step for me is thinking about what we can introduce that's beneficial immediately after steaming. And that's kind of what the, you know, all the recommendations are like, you're creating a clean slate. You don't want bad things to move in right away because they will take advantage of that. Um, so what can you introduce that's good? And I think about like when you take an antibiotic and right afterwards, I'm like, I need to eat sauerkraut. I need probiotics. All those things you want to introduce back into that kind of cleared out system. Nitrate is interesting. And at first, I think anecdotally, I had heard that nitrate increases right after steaming, but actually you're killing those nitrifying bacteria. So you're leaving a system that actually has more ammonium. If you can recall from um, your soil science that organic nitrogen gets broken down into ammonium and then nitrate. So by killing the nitrifying bacteria, you're, the other organisms that just get it to ammonium are actually present. And um, at the same time, you are releasing nitrogen from all the organisms that are getting killed because that's in like their cell structures. So it's kind of complicated, but um, the again, I think like thinking about how we can introduce beneficial organisms that will help um, convert the ammonium into nitrate is important and also not planting right away because the ammonium can be toxic to transplants. Um, I'm going to stop there. Um, that's kind of the bulk of what I was going to cover and let Andre go. I guess I can take the questions or people can chat questions. Did you want to ask a few questions first or did you want me to go ahead and chat? Let's just jump right into yours, Andre, and then we can do questions at the end. Okay. Um, well, my name is Andre Contelmo. I'm with Harvard Farm in Southampton, New Hampshire. I've been steaming for quite a while, um, and it was um, something that was uh, a skill that was taught to me by a flower grower who was just steaming for years and years before that. And um, so we started steaming. 15 or 17 years ago or something. And um, it's changed a lot throughout um, those years. We started with like many people, an undersized steamer for what we wanted to do. And then we started to get um, newer equipment and better equipment to do things. Um, 
Uh, what I'd love to talk about today is going to dovetail a lot off of what Bruce and Becky were talking about. I mean, we can get into other specifics later, but I'd like to address some things that came up. Um, so, Bruce, hit, you know, unbeknownst to me, like, you know, you're taught by somebody and you just do things and you don't know what you know sometimes. And particularly if you don't know why you know them, you know? So I think I've learned a tremendous amount from both Bruce and, and Becky and, and formulated my questions better. Um, even though I was kind of doing things right, I was just doing them because I was taught that way and not that I actually had any real knowledge of what I was you know, doing. And so Bruce brought up a really particularly important thing to me that his soils and spots were getting to like 212. Um, in order to get other parts of the um, of the um, treated area into the targeted temperature, which was like, you know, 170, 180. Um, and so um, what we started to do was come up with like, okay, so how can we answer these questions and how do we do that? And then the other thing was about like, what's going on with the biota and can we address these two things kind of simultaneously? So I'm gonna share my screen. I have, um, not put together a presentation for this particular thing. I have a very long seeming presentation. So I'm gonna skip through some slides and show you guys some stuff. If, um, I hope that doesn't get too confusing. Um, but the first thing I wanna talk about is, um, is, what, um, is what Bruce was saying with soil moisture. Now we use, um, in order to get the right heat and even heat, um, which is super important, um, no matter what system you're using, um, you have to have the correct soil moisture. And, um, you know, it's, it's listed in the literature as 25% of, so, of carrying capacity. And there are some, actually now the monitors have come way down. You can get some of these things from Brookdale Fruit Farm and other places. Toro makes a really good one. But there is a, I, and I apologize, I didn't edit the sound on this, so it might be loud, but this is my technique for knowing when the, um, Oops, I can't get the thing into share mode. I can't. Hang on a second. Presentation. There we go. Um, so grab the soil, squeeze the soil together. It holds together pretty well and yet still crumbles. Now, I don't, I'm not going to tell you that that's exactly 25%, but that's darn close. Um, the other thing that we used to do that we used to recommend to people, so if you saw a prior presentation of mine and that we don't do anymore, is that the soil moisture has to be right um, before we really get into that final tilling or bed prep. We used to just bed prep everything and then water. And the watering, the active watering, particularly with the sprinklers, really kind of filled in those cavities that Bruce was talking about. Like you need airspace and you need that moisture to conduct the heat, but you need the airspace to let the steam flow. And when we were watering, when we were, you know, just to get moisture into the beds after bed prep, we were basically sealing the top by like compacting all those air spaces out of the top, which was lengthening our steam time and making our distribution of heat um, more irregular. So getting to the right soil moisture ahead of time was really important. Um, the other thing I'll point out that we changed is that this is the same steam sock as Bruce had, and this is the seam that was in his steam sock. And so we have talked to the manufacturer and they don't make them this way anymore. Now they make them with all the grommets on one side. And that's because it actually is beneficial to you to have all the grommets up instead of half down, which... Um, and the, the reason for that is plentiful. Like this is a canvas stock, enough steam is leaking out of the bottom of this stock to get your soil temp. But also if you're looking to get to the right down pressure um, that occurs by having that tarp on top, it's preferable to have most of the steam going into the airspace above. And so um, we have taken to folding these socks the, the opposite way. Um, we also, now are steaming slightly larger areas with the same um, system. And the reason is that we are doing it with a zone control system. So the very thing that Becky was talking about, it's really difficult to get uh, your temperatures dialed in. 
we've decided to tackle that problem and come up with a, an onboard controller into the steamer that can more precisely deliver heat um, and more importantly, shut off heat when, when necessary. So instead of doing one bed at a time, we're now doing two. And if you want to take advantage of what Bruce was saying with having like uh, leaving the tarp across this area for 20 minutes, half an hour, what we've taken to doing now is having two more socks and another tarp. And you can disconnect those lead hoses that Bruce was talking about and hop them over to your next set and just leave the other one alone. And that's going to let things cook a little longer and also reduce your steam time, which reduces the amount of money that you're, you're doing. Um, all these combined, I'm going to say out loud, is I used to steam exactly the same way that Bruce steams. Um, and now the, some of the things I, um, we incorporated this year, we're using um, one third less fuel to achieve the correct temperatures. And it's mostly because we're not overheating as what Bruce was pointing out, getting to 212 takes calories, takes, takes fuel. And so basically by not, um, by not doing that, we're actually um, just using less fuel. Um, again, um, this is um, not a temperature sensor. Uh, I need to work on my temperature sensors. Um, Bruce showed me his and I, I went and got, um, from uh, a smoker, a barbecue setup from True Temp, which is like just some, if you want it, um, a Wi Fi uh, temperature setting and you put it in your barbecue outside and you're sitting inside your house, you can actually have the barbecue, like your meat settings in there. And all I did was cut that. And you have to use thermal couple wire. I used regular wire the first time I did this and it doesn't work. You need a wire, it's called thermal couple. And you can lengthen those probes from just the ones that sit on your barbecue and just go inside the barbecue to mine are now like 50 and 25 feet long. So now I have four probes, the length of my bed, and it Wi-Fi's to your phone and tells you the temperatures. And the reason that that's important is you wanna really over time find out what's the hottest spot in my bed. And for me, I kind of know that now. And so these probes, I put in at the two inch mark right here. And these are my temperature control probes. And um, the, I put the, whatever depth you want to go is the depth you would put it in. And it's important to put it in the hottest part of the bed. And this is the zone control system. And I set the output at 170 degrees. So at 170 degrees in this probe, we'll send it to this relay. And then that's going to shut off a butterfly valve at the steam generator, which I'll show you in a second. So these are those magnetic butterfly valves on the um, on the setup. And what happens is when the when it gets up to temp, these shut, and then that zone, that bed will shut off. And you can actually, just like Bruce said, you can actually on the monitor still watch the the um, thing climb. And sometimes even though it's set for 170, it might get up to 185 degrees before it starts going down again. But more importantly, if you look at your other temperature monitors, the little probes, you'll see that they're getting warmer, even though no steam is flowing through the sock. And so this is keeping things at, at a, a more controllable temperature. The other thing that's a tip if you're into steaming I don't know if Bruce said this, but see, this uh, is three pounds. I use this gate valve to make sure I have three pounds of back pressure, even when this valve is open. And that was counterintuitive to me. I was just like, open it all the way, let all the steam go. But um, this is a great way to reduce condensation problems by having enough back pressure in the chamber to make sure that that steam is staying up to temp and not cooling as soon as it's leaving. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but we can we can go over that more later if that's an, if people don't get that. Um, so unlike Bruce, you saw with the one sock, I have two, and um, I have a pleat in the middle, which basically made me buy more chain, you know, to have that. Um, but basically now these can run independently, 
This is long and loud and I, I'm gonna skip over it. It is gonna play when I hit it. If you wanna see it, um, I'm gonna let Amanda, I think you have a copy of this, they shared. Um, it could be available as a PDF to anybody if you wanna share that later, or um, if you wanna contact me, I will share these. But basically this video just shows the zones going on and off, but it takes like two minutes to cycle and I don't really wanna take all that time. But um, you can hear the steam running and then eventually you'll hear a valve click and the thing just uh, just blow up. But I'm just gonna move on to the next thing. Um, this is just the, um, the philosophy that um, Bruce went over and the temperatures that people were talking about. But one of the things, um, I, I can end right there, I think, except I have a cost analysis at the end, so I can go over that. But one of the things that I do wanna say about nitrification, if I can, while we have the temp thing up, is that um, there's a couple, oh, I know there's an inoculant slide too I wanna go over. So two things, one is that um, the danger of the death of the nitrification bacteria is not their death. It's the shattering of their cell structures that happen at temperatures above 190 degrees. So um, last year we had Steve Fedemore here and I was in contact with him a lot and I got, um, got forwarded to a bunch of Italian researchers that do deal with specific species of, back, of, of, of the flora and uh, fungi and, um, and fauna in the soil to understand their life cycles um, pre and post steaming. And one of the dangers is, and maybe Becky didn't get to it because she didn't push her soils that hard, is that if you go way too hot, you will make all that nitrogen immediately available. And um, these can, this can cause, particularly in transplants, because it goes away quickly. But if you transplant versus direct seed, you can see plant collapse. And it's really a strange plant collapse. It's like individual plants randomly throughout your house will just collapse. And I thought that I was doing this uh, by creating a spot for pathogenic bacteria to invade because I've killed off all of the beneficials. But it turned out that they were actually dying uh, from over nitrification, that the roots burned up. Um, so um, I'm embarrassed to tell you how long it took me to figure out that that's what was going on. But um, basically, um, if you get your soils too hot, this is this is a problem that you you can have. And so controlling the soil temperature is is important that way. And um, yeah, this is. Uh, Okay, so this is the inoculant that I wanted to show. And this is another thing that they have good data on. Now, I was up in, uh, at the Mafka Farmer to Farmer and we talked about this and some people mentioned some stuff and I followed up and it was true. Um, so basically, this is an inoculant that you can get from Johnny's and you see this laundry list of beneficials that go in, right? Um, sounds like an amazing thing to do to your soils. Turns out, that you can apply this to your soils after steaming and then they do tests afterwards and they can't find these species anymore after a few after a month they can't find these species at all and the reason is that they've been eaten and they've been eaten mostly by your beneficial your resident beneficials have bounced back um, and so what they find with this stuff um, is not so much that you're getting protection from these, although I have another theory and I'm gonna propose that. And I wanna, I wanna say that with a big farmer opinion flag waving, I have zero data to back this up. But my opinion is that these beneficials occupy an ecological space that um, slow down maybe um, the repopulation of, um, of your pathogens because they're occupying space. And then they're essentially like a fish food, like you're just putting fish food in a tank and your beneficials are eating them and then they bounce back. This incidentally is also what happens with the nitrogen fixing bacteria and the nitrate that's left in the soil. It actually gets re-ingested and becomes um, less available. And so you haven't poisoned your soil if you screwed this all up. I mean, it's going to, uh, the ecology of the soil will actually correct itself it's just, um, it just takes some time for those, um, for your residents to come back and, 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 uh, and, and get them back, back done.
Um, so this is some of my yield numbers after steaming. And so, um, and this is like, the reason that this is important is not so much like if you do better or worse. Um, the importance of, you didn't see my beginning slides, but they looked a lot like Becky's where basically it was unharvestable and there was nothing to be had out of some of my tunnels. So um, these, um, these numbers are uh, kind of an average over a few years of everything, but not spinach. And the reason I'm not including spinach is spinach is obnoxiously high yielder and would skew um, the numbers. So this is like, uh, you know, baby kales, mustards, um, uh, lettuces, uh, arugula, uh, mixed greens, that kind of thing. Spinach numbers can be much, much higher. Um, and um, I have definitely gotten fourth and even fifth cuts out of spinach in these houses, which is a little bit like unrealistic to think that you would get out of other species. Um, I think that's mostly due to its winter hardiness too. I, I mean, we all know spinach is like, we hardly ever cover it here, you know? Um, and so then the other thing is that like, this is the cost of, um, of steaming in these, um, in these sets. Um, I have a 20 year depreciation on the steamer. And the reason I have a 20 year depreciation on the steamer is that is the lifespan of the heat jacket inside it, which is the most expensive thing in the steamer and probably the thing that's gonna go and cause steamer death unless you wanna replace it. Um, and some of the um, labor numbers, fuel numbers um, for, for steaming. And so um, basically, if you see our, uh, our cost was, um, you know, um, about 17 cents a square foot for steaming this year, this past season. Um, and then we're thinking about like different fuel prices. Now the fuel went down, not up. Um, but um, I was just looking at like some possibilities and saying that even if the fuel went up this high, it still would only be 20 cents a square foot, which seems to me, um, you know, really a reasonable, um, uh, you know, a reasonable thing to, to, to think about doing still. Um, I think that that's it. Um, you know, we just do in the direct seed and the transplant crops, the transplant crops, I have to say, this is where I run into trouble. Like I ran into trouble in the past, but now is, you know, perfectly, perfectly fine. Um, a quick thing, um, we are recommending now, it's, uh, this isn't a hundred thousand BTU. This is, um, this is, um, this is a um, hundred thousand horsepower. So I, I, I don't know why I put BTU on the slide. So the steamer that you saw um, in the, the slides with, um, with uh, Bruce um, is a 20 horsepower unit. This is a hundred horsepower unit. Um, and this is over at Queens Greens, and we do five zones at a time. Their greenhouses are 34 by 200, and we do one half of a greenhouse at a time. And so it takes us two hours to do their 34 by 200 house, two and a half hours to, with the switch. So um, what I've been recommending to group buys now is not this unit, because it's way too expensive, but um, possibly we should be getting 50 horsepower units instead of 20s for sharing. And the reason is you can do an entire 30 by 96 greenhouse in two hours, two and a half hours, probably two hours with a 50. And this, if it was shared would maybe make more sense. But I think that, that we might be premature in that and that the shared unit is, um, is not booked solid to my knowledge yet. And so as we start to have these units booked, maybe we, we, if we up the horsepower of the units that we used as share units, then it might be able to be still really useful. Um, this is just uh, us moving the, um, the chains through the raised bed system there. Um, and they have uh, a very fancy, not like the one that I made, but they have a very fancy zone control 
um, onboard computer that actually has set times and start and stop run times on it as well now. Um, so um, basically saying that you can spend as much money as you want on something like this, but you know, it can be also done a little bit simpler. Um, and that's my contact information if anybody wants to jot it down. I think I did put it into the chat. And if so, if you have questions about steaming or where to get one or um, grant writing and stuff like that, I think I can be helpful with those things. Um, I had more to share, but I, I don't want to, I don't think that, I think that most of it would be better taken in the Q and A. Um, if, uh, I, 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 yeah, I think it'd be better to do in the Q and A. Amanda, do you want me to take it from here? All right, hey everyone, I'm Jeremy Delisle, UNH Extension here in New Hampshire, based in Merrimack County near Concord. Um, and so I'm gonna kind of help facilitate some of the Q&A section and try to kind of divvy out questions as we go to either get further explanation or maybe dig a little deeper. And I have some kind of general questions as well, but um, I did wanna say, you know, if you have questions now after hearing from the three speakers, now's a great time to pop those in the chat and we'll try to kind of work those in as they make sense over the next um, 20 or 30 minutes or so here. So please type those in if you have them. Um, Andre, there was kind of a follow-up to what you were talking about as far as um, inoculants. And um, one person, Rico, was asking uh, whether or not, are you saying inoculants are worth using to feed the resident microbes or are they not worth using? Um, and then there was kind of a follow-up to that, similar to Rika, have you tried different types of inoculants post-steaming? Um, and is there a, a variation on how well those have worked? Uh, yeah, so if you read Italian, there's awesome literature on this. Um, I relied on Steve Federmore uh, translations of the Italian and him sending me a bunch of graphs uh, with species and stuff in it. But they get pretty specific if you go to the root literature and there's a bunch of stuff there. Um, luckily they use the Latin name. So, I mean, it's all transferable. Um, I have only used the one inoculant available from Johnny's. Um, although I was at, uh, the Mid-Atlantic trade show, um, um, and, uh, vegetable meetings. And there were uh, a couple of vendors there that I visited with, um, many different kinds of inoculants specific for different things and different treatments. So it might be really interesting to see. Um, I think that um, the knowledge that the inoculant that you're using, um, particularly if you're not like trying to inoculate, you know, a legume or something, you know, <laughs> I mean, cause obviously they would harbor those. <laughs> um, but if you're just trying, you know, we're trying, we're, we're, we're doing targeted soil stuff um, that, um, Maybe the idea that we're going to get that mixed species right is is probably um, an illusion. But um, the data definitely showed that the bounce back was so much faster with the addition of inoculant. So I don't think that it's a bad idea to put inoculant down. Um, again, I want to stress how much like this is such a farmer opinion right now, and that I am not an authority. I mean, I have a degree in. Um, in soil science, and I still don't know what the hell is going on at this particular process. Um, although, you know, I can read the data. Um, I just know what the results are kind of leaning towards that. Um, if we put an inoculant in, the soils do better. Um, I don't understand the mechanism right now. Um, so what inoculant goes in um, is not exactly my expertise. Um, I might just add Jeremy to that. I think like, I, I agree with Andre, like there's um, a lot of unknowns. And I think if, you know, in general, the use of such materials, like honing in on what really needs to happen can help kind of parse that out. And there's a lot of good research, but I'd also encourage like distinguishing between inoculant, inoculants and biocontrols. And I sort of see the functionality of biocontrols in the scenario as being pretty tried and true in that um, as we're like wiping the slate clean with steaming that provides the opportunity for antagonistic organisms like Pythium and Rhizoc to come in. And we know those are brought in only mechanically. 
So making sure that we're like careful in our sanitation, you know, if you're, I mean, a lot of us can't be that careful, but like as much as we can, if you're steaming to not like carry equipment in from the field, that's going to have those like ubiquitous organisms on them. And you can use things like trichoderma and there's other things that really are tested, I think pretty, you know, without a lot of like literature review that wouldn't hurt and are affordable and a lot of people are using them anyway. So getting root shield in on all the transplants, for example, would, I think would be a very easily recommendable practice. Yeah, that's great. Thank you both. And Becky, uh, it seemed like so with your research, we're not quite there yet as far as understanding the specifics of like which species, you know, we're seeing, we can see like where there's more activity versus less, uh, but we don't necessarily know which of those are, you know, thriving in this environment or bouncing back more quickly than others. Is, is that something that we might see in the next yeah, I mean, I'm not even close on that. Like, I think this was like a very, you know, like this was a, I think a $30,000 grant for three years, you know, it was kind of like a, like, can we even like get at this question? So I think, you know, to be frank, I'm not going to be the person to do this research, but I think it would be a great project for somebody um, to take on. And I think it would involve like, you can use very specific enzyme lab tests to reveal each, you know, like, if you want to look at like nitrifying bacteria, you want to look at like sulfur, you know, like whatever you're looking at, there are ways to do it. And I did like kind of go back and forth with Deb about like, well, maybe we should like really hone in on a couple of things, but um, we sort of took the like low budget um, broad sweep, but, and I'm sure like, like Andre is saying, like there are people so far ahead of us on this, like Steve Fenimore has done a ton of work, like obviously Italy, <laughs> knows a lot, but we can't read it. So, um, but yes, I think I, I wasn't even close with getting at like what's actually happening. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to go to the chat for some questions um, that have popped in throughout while everybody was speaking. One was really about um, whether or not folks are, are seeming in the field as well as in tunnels. And so curious from the group experience you have field steaming and is that something that growers should be looking at or looking at this as an option for, or um, is it scale limiting at this point? You know, are, are the economics there? Do we feel like, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Um, my first field steaming was, um, is in our, um, we, right next to our farm stand, we have a children's garden. And so economically it really pays to have an incredibly clean garden for people to look at and that like, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a feature of the farm. Um, field steaming could be um, in, in certain crops could be profitable. And this was going into a question that you were gonna ask later, but I'll, I'll touch on it a little bit is that the, um, in high value crops like strawberries, for instance, um, if you are combining it with a biofumigant like uh, mustard meal or uh, a grown biofume again, um, then you're really getting it's such incredible benefits and those strawberries seem to jump right out of the ground and go. And this is the bulk of what Steve's work is about, right? I mean, like he's a strawberry grower, right? Or no, I'm sorry. He's a strawberry extension expert from UC Davis, right? Um, but the real um, kind of holy grail of steaming is that in the, Euro in the European systems, are they're one pass tilling steaming systems. And so there's a, there's three of those systems in the United States. One of them is in Yuma. And it's um it's a $1.7 million rig that basically tills, makes beds, steams, and everything is perfect out the other side. So that's something that we're not gonna do here, right? And so what we're working on now is different tillers, both in the greenhouse and uh, for the field that can do it. One of the problems with field steaming is slope, hot air rises. And so a lot of us don't have pancake fields, but we might have that in a greenhouse. So the success we see in a greenhouse, we might not see in a field because the incline will force naturally most of the heat to go uphill. Um, and we will find that um, we'll even end up with hard times holding down our tarps on the uphill side because the pressure starts to climb so great, but yet the pressure on the 
downhill side is so low. That can be solved a little bit with some vacuum, which we use vacuum also in tomato systems to get the steam deeper, quicker inside the tunnels, which we didn't talk about because it gets complicated. But if people want to know about vacuum, that's a different story. Um, so those are the problems with field steaming that tilling, tillage steaming would solve. Um, these systems that would be run with like a steamer the size that like um, Bruce or I are working with are very limited because to strip tillage um, steaming. Um, and then also we are working with um, Sue in um, the creation of a BCS attachment that is basically, um, you know, for a walk behind um, tractor in that way. So those two tillers are something that we're, a lot of work is being done this year, possibly have some prototypes by the end of the year and, and, and stuff, but we're 2024, 2025 before these things are any kind of cost effective way of the bringing it to the public, I think, you know, um, okay. to be truthful. So stay tuned and keep an eye out for some new developments that are maybe better suited to smaller scale and, and more affordable on those scales. Awesome. All right. Um, so this one, um, there's a question here about minimum uh, outside ambient temperatures or, you know, is there a target that you're looking for for temperatures? I'm assuming kind of in general that, you know, as, as soil temperature increases, you know, just requires fewer inputs to raise that from that point up to the, the target temperatures. Um, and, and this also, Becky, tied into um, something that you were talking about as far as um, the response rate from, you know, the, uh, the microbes that you were measuring and, you know, how quickly they responded. And I, I wondered if that was tied to temperature as well and what time of year that was happening. So just thinking about soil temps, you know, is there a target um, that you're looking for? Are you waiting until a certain point in the season until temps come up somewhat? Um, is that a factor? And I imagine it, it is a factor when it comes to the cost of, of getting the steaming done. Sorry, you're, you're talking about the the temperature, the outdoor temperatures. I think well, the temperature. question is about outside ambient temperatures, um, but you know, I'm I'm reading that as that that may tie into soil temperatures as well. Yeah, I mean, it takes more fuel to raise the temperature more. So, but you know, so I think Bruce actually had some pretty good data on the difference between like steaming in September versus October, and then even into November, how much more fuel it used, but um, it's pretty significant, I think, starting from, you know, wherever you're at in September, where it's still very warm. But yeah, and I think like in terms of the microbes, it's all those pieces of the soil environment, like the second year I did data on this, I took my initial soil samples after we had ripped out tomatoes and the soil was dry and hadn't had any living plants in it for like a couple of weeks maybe or maybe a week and there was like no like zero in my like my kind of first sample which is usually higher and it was just because the conditions I had it you know so a lot of this is a reflection of like the soil conditions and not so much what's happening with steaming and I was just like duh you know like you know that's what my sample is showing is that I had a poor environment. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, Bruce, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, Jeremy. Uh, uh, basically, yes, I agree. It is there is a a cost question if you're trying to take your diesel fuel and and start at a temperature of forty degrees and get to one seventy or one eighty. That's going to be different than if you're starting at seventy or eighty degrees, and so. Uh, Yes, uh, we're happier in terms of less fuel use and less time if we're doing it uh, more in the summer temperatures than in the winter. But um, as we know, we all have different cycles and timings and sequencing for when the house is open, when we're in between crops. And with the rental program, we have had a couple of uh, winter renters. We had somebody uh, using it last week and uh, about a year ago uh, this time it, it was out. and. Um, Last week's renter, it was his first time and he didn't feel like it was taking him super long, but he was also steaming an area that was about two thirds of, of our usual 
but uh, he was doing a two thirds size and still, I think he might've been getting up to it in about two and a half, three hours. Um, but uh, folks at another place last winter felt like, oh boy, this was a mistake to uh, <laughs> to try and do this in January. Yeah. So uh, long story short that there's nothing that mechanically that says you can't, but um, in terms of the of the costs and all, it's just, you got to factor that into when when is the when can I get the unit uh, and what my crop sequencing is? Um, so that's just about the sort of fuel and time and the, in terms of what's happening with the with the micro uh, organisms. That's another question. Yeah. Okay. Becky um, might have uh, access to in 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 the list. Like we have a steaming list serve, which I guess also has a Google group, which I haven't figured out yet. But um, Chris Callahan made a spreadsheet. There's one available from Sue, but Chris made it like super easy. And one of the factors in his spreadsheet was uh, Delta T. So your start and, and temp, and then that would give you an idea of fuel use and run times and stuff like that. And Becky might be able to put a link to that um, somewhere. Yeah. For I can share a link to it. And um, if we have time, I can pop it up here too. If people want to take a look at it. That's great. There is a question here about um, controlling diseases. Um, in this case, it's specific uh, to bacterial spec, but I'm curious if anyone's had experience with that or you know, really targeted their STEAM applications for control of, of a particular disease. Um, I know that here in Merrimack County, we have a grower that is hoping to use the same unit this year um, and they, they're after a soil-borne pathogen, um, Fusarium. And so they're gonna try to utilize it to see if they can knock back um, the disease pressure that they're seeing from Fusarium and, and just kind of compare and contrast, you know, beds that are untreated versus treated and see if they can see a visual difference there. But um, anyone else with experience or and any success stories to share on that, Andre? No, I saw Becky unmuted too. And I was about to say, Becky probably has a pretty good antidote about like not going treated and untreated in the same house. I suspect she would say, but I, I'll say it if she won't, but go ahead, Becky. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I, I guess um, I guess I would just encourage, I, so I don't have any experience with specific ones. I know like flower growers seem to be, um, and tomato folks like really more honed in on the specifics, but you know, fusarium, is going to be a, a lower temperature than bacterial spec. We, fungi are killed at a lower temperature than bacteria in general. But I'd also say just to, if people are asking to understand exactly the, like the biology of the organism they're trying to kill, like bacterial spec, I think can persist in the soil, but I also think it comes in on seeds and transplants too. I'm not a pathologist, but I'm pretty sure. Whereas fusarium is like in the soil ubiquitous. Again, if we're not moving soil between tunnels or on equipment, then you can be pretty confident that you would clear it out at least until, you know, gets tracked in somehow. So sure, that would be, I guess, my thought on that. Yeah. So we should expect good results, hopefully, from doing this in their tunnel. Um, I did just want to quickly ask Bruce, circle back around just the, the size of the plot that you're able to do at a single time with the current setup. Can you just repeat that for us? Yeah. Uh, six feet by a hundred feet. Okay. All right. But, and and uh, I, could also, the... I would also just double back on that on the disease question too. Um, we haven't had any big surprises or what the heck just happened as a result of our steaming. Okay. So um, that's just a. It, we haven't seen collapse over here. I'm, I'm still alive. <laughs> So right on that, like what what are we recommending as far as like how long to wait after steaming before before planting? Well, as as Becky was saying, and she may be able to um, chime in too, but if you're if your transplants are going to be hitting the the ground living quicker than seeds, so you're more likely to run into trouble with transplants. And um, we put in the kale maybe about three days after. And, uh, and didn't see the kind of uh, unusual uh, dieback that Andre, that Andre described. Okay. 
So um, I don't know, Andre or Becky, three days? Right now with the zone system, I was literally still steaming and they were planting the other mm. side. So I don't wait at all now. Mm. Um, as a matter of fact, I kind of like that the soils are a little warm for them uh, coming out of uh, a house. And, you know, like even though I'm trying to harden them off before they're going out for the winter, um, you know, um, a lot of times my timing is just such that like I'm, you know, this is what's happening. Um, in the past, I would have waited a couple of days or something with the transplants particularly, but um, I'm not waiting at all anymore. Yeah, I mean, we we actually don't wait very long on our farm either and haven't seen harmful effects, but I think, so I'm still trying to like scratch the itch of like what exactly happens when like you're, like you're, like Andre saw those transplant problems. I think, um, you know, the I was reading up on it a little before and it, I think like when there's primarily ammonium, so NH4 plus in the soil, plants will take it up but if they take up too much, it'll kind of deprive them of sugars and carbohydrates. And that's when they get limp and kind of like, like floppy and then they die. And then at really high levels, it can burn roots. Like you've probably seen from like high concentrations of like chicken manure. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's the danger. If you don't have a ton of organic matter or things that are gonna be converted into ammonium and steaming, I think you're probably okay. But um, I don't really know. I think a lot of us anecdotally are kind of just like winging it, planting, and we've been okay. So, okay. interesting. Yeah, to, to hear the spectrum there. So, hedge your bets for three days or possibly plant quickly after, but right, site specific and soil specific, depending on the organic matter and the source of that ammonium that's being released. And just to right. note, you can take a sample that like most labs will turn it around in 24 hours if you're concerned and they'll give you, you can ask for nitrate and ammonium like on a 24 hour test. So I don't know. Yeah, good option. Um, okay, so th this was a question that I had on my sheet to ask too. It's just about frequency of, of steaming. Um, sounds like there's a little bit of um, variation there as far as how often folks are doing this and whether or not it's it's annual or kind of as an ad needed um, basis. Um, how, how often are the folks, the experts on our call doing this? Any more than once a year? Uh, currently at Piccadilly, we're just doing it once a year uh, in the fall before the fall greens uh, and trying to be a stay ahead of the chickweed. And yeah. so we've got two years of, of doing that and they've been pretty happy years. And so I think we'll do it again this fall. And I'm not sure at some point, maybe we'll throttle back and try and skip a year and see what happens. Yeah, right, once but, you get uh, that. Yeah, yeah we haven't year. been doing it. We haven't been doing it in the, in the spring or other times of year ourselves. We we do it in the fall on all houses every year, um, and we do eleven houses um, a year. Um, I generally only skip them when I'm running short on time, and I'm like, I just justify to myself that oh, that wasn't that 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 house was in great condition last year, and then I'm always sad that I didn't um, do it. So I haven't figured that one out yet. And we off we often for tomatoes do it in the spring. Even with our graphs, we find that the inner nodes between um, between flower sets are much shorter um, in the steamed tunnels than unsteamed tunnels. So much so, so that um, I've generally made it a general practice to doing that. Um, you know, there was uh, some other research done about it, um, the health of tomatoes. And it really does um, help. It, it, I, I, I've seen huge yield differences enough to completely justify that practice. Um, but it becomes another thing you're doing in the spring. So that is really problematic in the flow of farms that I imagine are on this call. If you're anything like me, it's, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's something I kind of find that I'm forced through my farm instead of like having any kind of workflow that really works. So it can be hard. 
All right. Thank you. Um, the other, there's a question here that I wanted to get to, and uh, Billy Cornelius, if, if you're on, please feel free to unmute and chime in. But um, the question is about steaming in fields um, and whether or not there's other equipment to use um, in a field application um, or would it need to be covered and, and piped um, or with the, the steam sock, I'm assuming is what he means here. Um, he's got about three acres uh, that he would like to be able to implement a practice like this on, but concerned about the time and investment that would go into that. Well, the tobacco, I mean, like really, the, the, again, like everybody says, like, you know, Becky was stressing, this is all old, you know, all old stuff. And so if we look back at the tobacco industry, especially in the Northeast, they did pan steaming and they just walk these pans through the field. And um, it's just much shorter run but there's just like two pan setups and um, you put the pans down and you steam and then you pick the pan, one pan up and put it in front of the other pan. And you're just like walking through the field. And they did this before they planted tobacco. And, you know, it was, uh, and, and that's the oldest school. There are injection knives underneath the pan that just go stab the soil and steam the whole thing. The run times are much shorter than what we're talking about. Um, and it would eliminate the 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 thing I was talking about incline and stuff. So um, the technology is out there. It's old. It's probably findable. Um, probably even in some uh, you know tractor supply type um, you know warehouse of of parts and stuff. You might even be able to scroll through and find some of that equipment around. I often stumble across that equipment. I would say that the equipment probably. Most of the other steamers that people are using when they're starting out are old tobacco steamers, which are kind of really worn and undersized, um, but they can be refurbished. And they're also a really great place to start with steaming because you can get them cheap. You can get them for a few thousand dollars um, versus what these other machines cost. Um, so I would just caution about the use of the old tobacco steamers because they can seem like a good deal, but frustrations can build up. But also, if you're um, realistic about what you're trying to do, it might be a great start because it's affordable. Right. Great. And then there was a question here about the tomato houses, um, whether or not those are still under plastic or out in open ground in the field. And so, Andre, what you were talking about with tomatoes, those are all in ground, uh, under, under plastic in tunnels, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, let's see. Um, got a few questions left. I think we have about 10 minutes. Um, we've talked about frequency of steaming. We've talked a bit about fuel. Um, mainly though that Andre, you had, you know, you were able to reduce your fuel consumption by about a third um, using uh, the dual system. And so Along those lines, I was curious about, um, you said you had a pretty good idea now about where the hot spots were under your tarps. And is that just from setting up those four temperature probes? And like, is this, is it always the same spot? Like, is it closest to the steamer? Is it farthest away? No, it's not farthest away. Although actually, well, ironically, and Bruce should chime in on this too, because I think Bruce and I kind of chased this together a bit, but we found that it's actually pretty much in this towards the center of the beds, but we never measure where the sock is. We measure away from the sock for our temperature measurement. But um, as far as the length of the bed, I meant the center. Um, the end of the bed can get quite hot as well and sometimes has beat out the um, center as the hottest spot. But what never is the hottest spot is where the steam enters. It's always usually the coldest spot, ironically, um, in, in my monitoring. And I, you know, I think Bruce can have his own observations, but that's generally what's going on. But it has never, um, the confidence level is not such that I run the, the probes without also having the monitors underneath and saying, ooh, that's running hotter and picking up the monitor and moving it if I have to. So, um, so it was kind of like saying that with a caveat as to where the hottest spot is, but um, yeah. Bruce has some experience and he actually helped me track down the hottest spots as well. Yeah, I, I would say it's hottest in the middle of the run. 
definitely. And then um, usually coldest closer to this to the steam sock to the entry point. But uh, once I think I found I was hotter at the beginning. So every, every so often things seem a little bit screwy, but it's going to be hottest in the middle, almost almost invariably. So to to kind of build on Andre's um, practice there of or no Bruce, I think you were both talking about this actually kind of, but um, you know tracking that to a point, getting close to your target temperature, and then coasting for that thirty minutes or so, give or take, towards the end. So we would then be looking at. Which of those sensors do you feel like it's most important? Well, you're two steps though, Jeremy, you're putting two steps together there. Um, like Bruce was also saying that, um, and this is just something that the zone does by by itself without you babysitting it, but um, when it get, that center gets too hot, you shut down the machine or you shut down the steam to that area. Mm -hmm. And then this gives the rest of the bed time to catch up separately, you're supposed to hold 170 degrees for a certain amount of time. And what Bruce was saying is then when the when when you do achieve that across the bed, then you shut down and coast the whole bed. So there's actually two kind of shutdowns for reasons, but the other the other like they're they're kind of two different, you're achieving two different goals. Like you first you have to get the whole bed up to temp and then you can coast. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, so I, I can add. Uh, so in the in the last couple of years of of trial and error, we ha we are finding ways to do this manually, just you know measuring the temperatures ourselves and then opening and closing the the valve at the generator, and uh, and that's good. And now uh, Andre is also working with Sue to get some um, electric solenoids and temperature monitoring that can do that for us. And um, so there's benefit there. And I have been talking a little bit with the Sioux Corp people to see if we could, how, what it would be like to get a couple of those solenoids for the steam generator in this rental program. And so that may be something that uh, is in our, in our future here as well. Excellent. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat right now, but if you, if you do have them, now's a good time to kind of squeeze those in here at the end. We've got about five minutes left. I want to make the most of our time. Um, we heard a bit from Andre about economics and the cost of fuel and various scenarios there. Um, you know, the cost to steam a house with labor um, to run the steamer itself included. So we have a sense about that. Um, you know, Andre, anything else to add about plans? Um, for steaming in new and different ways going forward. You wanna to touch on that anymore? Well, I mean, this this was concentrating on soil steaming, but one of the things that I think has changed my farm a little bit is since I have one, that um, we actually steam sterilize all of our um, 1020 trays and other pots because um, we reuse so much. And because we have that probe, <laughs> We can only bring those up to 160 degrees without melting everything in our container. So we put them in a box truck and just basically put the steam so sock, so, um, not the steam sock, the steam <laughs> pipe underneath the door, which stuffed with some reme and just the probe in there. And when it gets up to 160, the solenoid shuts, like Bruce was saying, shuts it off. <laughs> um, and uh, we just hold everything that we can fit in that container for 30 minutes and pull it all out and rather confidently fill it with our potting mix and drive on. Um, how, how about tools? Are you putting tools in there as well? I hadn't. I mean, listening to Becky sounds like a really, really good idea if you're going to bring a tiller from inside to outside. Um, however, I don't ever use my tools before I steam. I mean, after I steam. So, you know, um, the workflow is such that I'm probably, but it's a good idea. Um, I can see the, the benefit. Some of those people are using steam cleaners, which are high pressure steam or high pressure water or something, which would make it better for cleaning. This mm -hmm. is low pressure steam, which right. is pretty safe and, um, and usable in, in those other ways. Um, 
Some other things that people have done with steam in uh, the houses that I've been recommending is um, some people have been steaming whole sections of their house, um, like with just releasing steam because they had problems, um, you know, in uh, infesting in the in the walls uh, of of the place. Um, I don't. I, I don't. I, it's not a practice that I do, so I don't know much about that. I'm more excited about the way some of the tillage stuff is going. So, we did have a kind of a reoccurring question about um, whether or not anybody's seen any added benefits um, in respect to reducing insect pest pressures. Anyone had had issues that they were dealing with prior to getting into steaming that are now less of an issue? Um, I can just speak to that a little bit, Jeremy, that um, the, so literature kind of says insects and mites, including their eggs are killed at like 140 to 160. So they should be killed. Obviously some pests are flying in and um, not residential in the soil. So again, understanding the life cycle of the pests is important. I was hopeful we've had winter cutworm problems. I was hopeful that our timing of steaming would like kill them and um, I think it might have delayed them, but I think they flew in and lay their eggs and they still survived steaming um, yeah. or else they were like, there were eggs in other places in the tunnel. So that was a bust. Um, I also feel like we've seen worse aphid pressures after steaming. And that's purely anecdotal, but we had like crazy potato aphid problems like I've never seen last year. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if we wiped out some of the beneficial populations and provided like a better environment for the aphids. But again, it, you know, I know they're bad a lot of farms the last couple of years, so not sure. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Becky. Anybody else? Bruce? Yeah, I don't have any uh, big insect data one way or the other. Doesn't seem to be different than it was before I was steaming. Okay. All right. Um, Let's see, I think, um, so it looks like there was a question there about the Google group and it looks like Amanda's kind of answered that. Um, so you just have to email Amanda for that if you're interested in uh, being involved, hearing more about the, the Google Steamer group. Email um, Becky, email, oh, Becky, email Becky. Sorry, okay. All right, well, I think that concludes the uh, Q and A section, so. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate all your all your questions, and to the speakers, thanks for all your input and prep for today, and kind of spreading the word and sharing with us what you know to this point about steaming. So great resources, all of you. And with that, I'll hand things back over to Amanda. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. Actually, I think Andy is going to wrap things up for us today, so I will I'll hand it over to him. Sure. Thanks, Amanda. And uh, yeah, I get to just wrap things up here. Um, and I just want to thank everyone for your time today and for your interest in soil steaming. And I want to thank all of our presenters and the project partners who have been uh, working on this project for the past few years. And I uh, just want to point out a few resources here. Um, first, uh, Amanda put in the chat earlier on uh, today the website for the Cheshire County Conservation District. And uh, if you go to the website under the Farm and Equipment Rental tab, you'll find information regarding the soil steaming rental, as well as other uh, equipment that's available for rent um, throughout the, the region and state. And within uh, underneath the soil steaming component there is the guidance document that Bruce pointed out, as well as some videos, which include um, opportunities to see steaming both at Piccadilly Farm and Heron Pond Farm as well with, with Bruce and Andre. Also, this recording will, will be posted as well on the website. The UVM Extension website has several great resources, much of which have been developed around Becky's research and experience with soil steaming. And as uh, Jeremy mentioned, Becky has put in, if you put your uh, email in the chat there, she can uh, get you connected with the uh, soil steaming group that she's uh, pulled together and manages. And I also just want to mention on the ATRA website, we have a new website with a forum uh, component. And uh, perhaps Becky and I can get together and sort of see about possibly expanding out that group uh, to other folks who are interested outside of the Northeast on, on soil steaming. Um, but I would uh, like to go ahead and unless someone uh, on this on this Zoom beats me to it, but I can create a soil steaming uh, tab under the equipment materials and techniques topic area. 
And we can post this video there as well as some other research and, and information for soil steaming as well as any questions and just sort of dialogue you'd like to uh, connect with other farmers and researchers about. And finally, just uh, if you have any other questions regarding the rental program or how to uh, sign up for the soil steamer, uh, make sure you visit the Cheshire County Conservation District website and you can touch base with Amanda and Benet to reserve uh, a time to, to use the equipment. So thank you all again and uh, hope you have a great, uh, great rest of your day.